Hi guys, I'm Bobsy, and in this video I'm going to go over the network identity and the network behavior of Pernet. These are pretty much synonymous as the network behavior is also a network identity. But I want to show you a bit of how you use it inside scripting and some of the things that you have access to. Now it can do more than what I necessarily show in this video and also ownership is going to be a video of its own because that's a big topic. However, in this video I'm going to show you some of the things you can do to utilize network identities or network behaviors properly through scripting. So I've made my own little test behavior script here, which is just a completely new and blank script. Now, one of the things that's very important that you know about them, so let's just start by converting it into a network behavior or network identity. You can do both. Network behavior is just very familiar to a lot of people. Now, one of the things that's very important to know is that contrary to popular systems like Mira and Fishnet, they are not game object based network identities. They are component based, meaning that if I just create an empty game object, I call it test, I add a network transform. And let me also add, uh, I don't know, let's do prefab link, which is typically added automatically by the network prefabs. Now, for example, these are both network identities and identities are um, their own ID and their own thing. So this identity has its own ID, this prefab link has its own ID, this game object is now essentially consisting of two network identities. So contrary to a system like I believe in Mira, they have network identities that are, you know, game object wide. In Fishnet, they have network, or network objects that need to be on the root of a game object in hierarchies. This is very different because, you know, each network identity is its own thing, also meaning that, you know, we can disable individual identities, enable individual identities, and they're essentially gonna act as their own their own object. Uh, so they aren't linked, on, linked as per se on a game object basis. Now, going back into the script, it's just very important that you know that these kind of stand on their own. This is also what makes you able to nest them exactly how you want. Like if these were prefabs, I could do this, no problem. And this would work perfectly fine still, because again, they're completely stand on their own. And we could just, you know, despawn this and despawn this, and you'd still have these two. Or for example, if you spawn the object, again, I'm not going to show the whole thing here, but if you know, we spawn this core test object, we could just take these, move them out, delete this original object, and that'll still work in networking. This is one of the things that I find very powerful about what we're doing here with Pernet, is that you have so much freedom in how you use it, because we really want to allow you to use it like you would if you were making a single play game. Now, go back into the script. Um, <clears throat> there's some other things that are really good to know. So, for example, in order to do spawning and despawning, there has to be a network behavior present of some kind. You can't just spawn a game object. You can if, again, it has a network identity on it, because then that's something the network can reference. So, you know, you can just call instantiate on a game object as you would normally. If I just open up, uh, I guess technically you shouldn't do it on starts. So that was a bad case. But let's say an update, you were doing it if input.getKeyDown, keycode.k, hey, whatever. Then you do instantiate and you instantiate some, you know, prefab game object. This would work networked and it will auto network the spawning if this test object has a network identity on it. Whereas if it doesn't, then it's just going to spawn it locally because there's nothing it can use to cross reference. <coughs> Another cool thing about network identities is you can actually send behavior across or you can send behaviors across the network. I believe you can do this in both Fishnet and Mirror as well and other systems, but it's just a very handy thing to know. So for example, if we have a server RPC, we do a private void, test RPC, we can actually have our test behavior and we can just call that test in here. We can actually send that. So, you know, the client could do this and just send the, its own script to the server. In this case, I don't really know why you would do it, but you get the idea. You can cross reference them and that'll work perfectly fine. Uh, you can also actually send the whole game object. So we can just expect a game object over here. And this will also work fine. Again, as long as the game object has a network identity or network behavior on it. So you can completely cross reference them very easily in code. So again, this is kind of similar to how you might write single player code and send references through methods. You can also do that over the network. Now, other good things to know, and again, I'll have a video more dedicated to the network manager, but you actually also have direct access to the network manager in the network identities. So, you know, you can always just do network manager dot whatever you want to do. If you want to handle something with the, you know, on player scene join, for example, and you want to subscribe to that, you always have direct access to it in any network identity as well. So just having easy access to the network manager is nice and easy. Otherwise you can always just do network manager dot main. Oh, whoops. With the capitalized network manager dot main, and you'll always get your main network manager, and you can also get it through the instance handler. So we can also do instance handler dot network manager. Same thing, you still are able to get it like this. 
And one of the other things that is good to know is you can always get information on yourself and for that second the object. So for example, we can do if we press K and we are the owner. So you can just easily do its owner. You can also check who the owner is and if there is an owner. So you can do owner that has value. That means does it even have an owner? Or for that sake, if we know that it has an owner, so in this case, we already do owner that has value. We can also do owner dot value. And then we can check, you know, is that some player that we might want to check? Or that can also be the local player. And again, this is another thing. We just got the local player. Now, one thing, again, ownership is going to be its own thing. But you might notice that when I write owner and I write local player, there's a little question mark here. If you're not familiar with this idea, this essentially means that it's a nullable value. That's why you can write dot has value. It means that it actually has the possibility to not have a value. Similar to classes that can be null. This is essentially how we allow structs to have a similar state of null. It essentially means there is no value here. There's no value held. And this is how you would check it. And this is also how we check if it has an owner. And it's also how we check if you have a local player. Now you might think, why would I not have a local player? Well, in the case of you being a dedicated server, for example, that won't be a local player because it's not a client, so it's not a player. I hope that makes sense. And again, ownership will dive a little bit deeper into this concept. But I essentially just wanted to show you, you can do all of this like check host or check if you're the client and so on and so forth. And you can even check if you are the controller of the object. <coughs> Now, another cool little detail you can do is let's change this back into network identity. And then let's try and handle some spawning on this network identity. So let's, for example, say uh, spawned identity, which will instantiate this new test identity. One thing you can do is, you know, obviously since, and again, this is going to come in the ownership video too, but you can immediately just, you know, give ownership immediately as you spawn it. But another thing you can also do is you can queue actions. So you can actually queue on spawned and then you can have something happen in here. So for example, if you want some logic to run on it, you can do like this and you can queue some kind of action. So we can, for example, say spawned dot, I don't know, name is equal to uh, spawned action if we wanted to do that. And then, you know, this will only run as soon as it's spawned. Again, setting the name might be a weird example, but if you wanted to run some logic on the network, let's say that this network identity had, actually let's say we're spawning a new test behavior. And let's say that this test behavior has a public void uh, test RPC, and this is a server RPC. And let's do ground ship false. And then, you know, the RPC does whatever it does. Then you can make sure that the new spawned object will call this test RPC whenever that it's ready. So essentially now you'll spawn it. And then once it is fully spawned, it'll now call test RPC on it, but only once it is spawned. It's essentially the same as if it had the unspawned override. And we'll get into that in just a second. But it'll be about the same if it had the unspawned override and it called it like this. But now you're just allowed to do it customly on only this one that you've chosen to spawn in here. We just thought this was a handy little extra feature to have. Now, let's get a little bit into what I just did here with the unspawned. Essentially, there's a few things that you can override and they call on obviously each their own times. So let's start from the very beginning, similar to how you have a wake in Unity. We have uninitialized modules. Uninitialized modules is the very first callback that you see. And uninitialized modules will happen essentially pre-spawning. So this is like a before it's fully done spawning, you can initialize modules. This is extremely useful if you want to on the fly, but still over in the network, be able to initialize custom network modules, like for example, your SyncVar. We can do we can do tests SyncVar, and you can then here say SyncVar equals to new and it'll default to eight for, for some reason. You could do this in uninitialized modules because this object isn't yet spawned. You could technically also do this in awake, uh, whereas in other systems, you're typically forced to do it up here, but you don't have to, which allows you to use dynamic values. Now, after uninitialized modules, you essentially have unspawned, which was what I showed. And you'll notice that two unspawned, they run at the exact same time. The difference is one of them have a bool for whether you are the server or not. But it'll pretty much be about the same as if you go in here and you check if you are the server like this. Um, so it's really up to you and up to preference, but for people who want it, that's nice and easy. Obviously, again, by the end of our lifetime, we can also despawn. So similar to unspawned, there's also an on despawned, an exact same thing. And you can also have the bool for a server in here, like so. <coughs> <coughs> Then we also have the callback for when ownership changes. So we have on owner changed. And then we also have other callbacks for other owner things like on owner connected and on owner disconnected. And I think the names are pretty self-explanatory for what it does, but essentially on owner changed is called whenever the game object was given or the, sorry, the network identity was given a new owner. 
<clears throat> one of the reasons why it was important to also know that network identities are their own thing is because they can actually split ownership. So this test behavior could have me as an owner, but if we had another test behavior on the same object, that could have you as the owner. And we could both be owners of, of components on the same game object, which is very cool freedom to have. Now on owner connected, obviously gets called if let's say that I disconnected, I reconnected, and you know, I now have been given the same player ID because of the cookie system in Pernet then we'll now know that I've connected. It could be, let's say you have a robot and you wanted it to have a light on the, on its head whenever I'm in the game. So when I'm in the game, you'll on owner connected, set this light to red, and then on owner disconnected, you'd set the light to gray. As you know, it's gone out. And essentially this is about it. You have quite a lot of freedom working with network identities and these callbacks that I just showed you in the end are immensely useful. And mostly, at least for my sake, I mostly use the unspawned. I just find that really useful to be sort of the default like start method in Unity but just for a network. So at this point, we know that it's now ready on the network and ready to call RPCs and do whatever it needs to do on the network if you need to change sync bars or whatever. So I really hope this little brief overview of network identities was helpful. I know it was a little bit messy, but there's a lot to it and it's generally fairly simple. If you really want, you can always click into the network identity. So if I just went to network behavior, I can go to network identity and then into the main identity. You can actually see what's available to you here. So here you can see all the spawned, has owner, is owner, is host and so on. And you can essentially see all the calls that you got available to you publicly or protected for that sake as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully this was helpful to you and you learned something new about how to use Pernet. And other than that, please do leave a like, comment, subscribe. Remember to join the Pernet Discord if you have any issues at all or just want to discuss your game development, share how your game's progress is going. And other than that, I just hope that you have a wonderful day.